everybody to the, uh, the second contributed session in room one. Uh, our first speaker is Rebecca Palmer, who will be telling us about totally geodesic surfaces and not complements with small crossing number. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to speak. I'm really excited to be here. It's been a great workshop thus far. Um, and I'm always excited to talk about these totally geodesic surfaces. Um, everything that you're gonna see here has been joint work with Conlay. So let's start off by just telling ourselves, you know, what is a totally geodesic surface? So imagine that you have a surface sitting inside of a three manifold uh, in particular for this talk. And then you call that surface totally geodesics if the geodesics of the surface and the manifold coincide. So a way to think about that is that if you have two points on the surface, then the shortest path between them, right, that geodesic is going to stay on the surface. You don't get any shortcuts through the um, larger ambient three manifold. Today, of course, we're going to be looking in particular at um, a manifold that is a hyperbolic knot complement. And there are two ways that uh, we're going to be looking at these totally geodesic surfaces. One way is if we're looking at the existence of them, we're going to be lifting to hyperplanes in the universal cover and use the representation, like the, the normal geometric one, where you take your fundamental group into PSL2C and that acts on a hyperbolic three space by isometry. For absence, though, um, we're going to be looking at its behavior in the second cohomology group rel boundary with integer coefficients. And by doing that, we're going to take a representation that actually goes to PSL2R, and that's going to act on the circle. A thing to keep in mind is that both this row and this phi are going to induce maps from the fundamental group of the surface to PSL2C and PSL2R. And it's not going to be the normal ones, right? So that phi that goes to PSL2R isn't actually going to be the geometric one of the surface. So just like keep that in mind, like forget everything abstractly about the surface and think of what it actually looks like under maps with regards to the ambient three manifold. So here's kind of like a summary of what we know about totally geodesic surfaces in not complements thus far. Here are two of them. We have the knot 820, great. And we also have the uh, figure eight knot. So in 2006, Caligari was able to show that this knot 820 has no totally geodesic surfaces whatsoever. That's uh, very contrasted to this um, statement by Alan Reed in 1991 that the figure eight knot complement has infinitely many totally geodesic surfaces. The statement about 820 actually is a little more general. So Caligari shows that if you have a fibered knot complement, which just means that your knot complement can be written as a direct product, and the trace field has odd degree, I'll explain what trace field is in a little bit, right? Then your uh, 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 three manifold doesn't have any totally geodesic surfaces whatsoever. On the flip side, Botter, Fisher, Miller, and Stover very recently showed that a hyperbolic knot complement contains infinitely many totally geodesic surfaces if and only if that knot is the figure eight. Um, it has to do with arithmeticity. So if people care about that there, I've thrown out the word, but I'm not gonna go into any detail because what we really care about is all the remaining knot complements have to contain finitely many totally geodesic surfaces and that finite might actually be zero. So let's try and count them. As of 2019, this is what we knew about hyperbolic knots with small crossing numbers. So at most nine, this is just um, pulled from Rolfson's knot table in order. And so we have that one figure eight knot that has infinitely many totally geodesic surfaces and the smattering of knots that don't have any. So Khan and I have been working on trying to expand and like color in more of that uh, chart by looking at both existence of totally geodesic surfaces and showing that it's been unique and then uh, no totally geodesic surfaces. For the existence of unique totally geodesic surfaces, the idea is that we're going to take a known totally geodesic surface and take a candidate surface and then see what happens to so show that like all the candidate surfaces fail and we only have the known one. Uh, we've got these three families. There are the twist knots with odd prime half twists. We've known that since um, 1985, thanks to Colin Adams. So that's, the, um, that's a thrice punctured sphere. Then we have the balanced pretzel knots with odd prime twists per tangle. The totally geodesic surface in there is actually that uh, ciphered surface. I believe that's a once punctured torus. That's uh, something from Adams and Schoenfield. And then Khan and I were able to show that there is in fact a twice punctured torus that is totally geodesic in the knot 7-4, but it doesn't show up nicely in the diagram, but like trust us, it's, it's there. On the flip side for the absence, we have this uh, big old theorem, which is if you have a hyperbolic knot complement and the trace field has no proper real subfield other than Q, and you have the ciphered surface with minimal genus, then if you have the existence of some representation from your fundamental group into PSL to R, that's a Gawa conjugate of your geometric map, such that the absolute value of the Euler class with respect to that map of the ciphered surface is less than two G minus one, then your manifold doesn't contain any totally geodesic surfaces. I went through that quickly because I'm not expecting you to recognize a whole bunch of words in that theorem, but I wanted to put it up there and we'll get to that later. But this is just to kind of highlight the dichotomy. And in particular, you'll notice that for the existence, the words odd prime keep showing up. 
And for this theorem, we have that trace field. The trace field also showed up in the um, Caligari theorem. And those two ideas are connected very, very tightly. So the trace field is what happens when you have a um, representation of a fundamental group into PSL2C, you're going to take all of the traces of all of the elements, a joint with Q and close. And that gives you, you know, a field and we call that the trace field, which seems like a little silly at first, but it actually gives us a lot of really cool properties. For example, if you have a hyperbolic knot complement, there will exist a covering map from hyperbolic three space down into your manifold, such that all of the pre-images of your knot cusp are going to lie in this trace field union infinity, where um, like that's thinking of that as the boundary of like um, uh, the complex plane union infinity. So we know like we can find out where all of the cusp pre-images are. We also have this really baller proposition, which is if you have a hyperbolic knot complement and its trace field has odd degree over Q and its trace field has no proper real subfield over Q and this group has integral traces, then your manifold contains no totally geodesic surfaces and any remaining like cusped totally geodesic surface, the traces of that um, surface are going to have to be integers. So that gives us nice control over any remaining totally geodesic surfaces once we've cut out the compact ones. This odd degree and this no proper subfield other than Q are satisfied by that odd prime condition that was in the existence uniqueness column. So that's how this all starts tying together. So now let's actually talk about this um, existence property. We want to be comparing a totally geodesic surface that we know to a candidate totally geodesic surface. And one way that we compare surfaces is that uh, we can look at their intersection. And if you have two totally geodesic surfaces in a hyperbolic knot complement and they have a non-empty intersection, then their intersection is actually the union of like closed geodesics and cusp to cusp geodesics. So none of their intersections do this thing that you see kind of like on the far right where it just kind of winds out into, into nothingness within the manifold. It either closes up or shoots all the way out. So this is a great lemma, but we actually have to show that these surfaces would intersect. And how do we do that? There's a property that's very specific to cusp uh, surfaces, which is a boundary slope. So if you have a cusp surface, at some point is going to have to cross this boundary of the manifold, right? It has to cross this torus uh, neighborhood of a knot. And when it does that, it's going to intersect along a curve. And that curve is going to be going around the meridian a certain number of times and then going around the longitude a certain number of times. And that ratio of meridian to longitude is the boundary slope. The meridian and the longitude both occur as elements in the fundamental group, and their images occur as matrices in PSL2C. So this boundary slope appears as both uh, in the manifold and in the universal cover. So in the bottom left there, we have, like you can imagine that that's a puncture in the blue totally geodesic surface. As that blue surface approaches that uh, cusp in the middle, it sees the meridian once and it doesn't see the longitude. So that's a boundary slope of one over zero. In the universal cover, uh, so imagine this, this is like a cartoon version of what Dr. Purcell was showing with the snappy thing, where we're sitting at infinity and we're like staring down into the boundary into the complex plane. This meridian and longitude are going to um, essentially act as axes, as generators for this complex plane. And when you do the lift of the totally geodesic surface, according to this cusp, it shows up like as visual lines that have a one over zero slope. Right. Uh, these are vertical hyperplanes, so you can imagine that they're coming out of their face. But if you just want to like project them down to the complex plane, you have this uh, one over zero slope. So that's fun. So now let's put that back into the three, three situations we know about. So we've got these twist knots, these balanced preps knots, and this knot seven four. Using this trace condition that the traces of the surface have to land in the integers, Khan and I calculated the exact set of boundary slopes for any totally geodesic surface that could possibly exist in any of these knot complements. Right, um, and just that means that like, you'll have a cusp totally geodesic surface and it has to admit like, for example, in the twist knot, it has to admit at least one cusp of one over zero and one cusp of negative two and no other, like, no other boundary slope is possible. What that looks like in the universal cover, if we wanna look at our known surfaces is we've got this thrice punctured sphere in the twist knot with the boundary slopes one over zero and negative two. We've got this ciphered surface in the balanced pretzel knot, which just has the, um, the boundary slope zero. And we have this uh, somewhere surface in seven four that has um, uh, two cusps and uh, uh, slopes plus and minus two. And you'll notice that uh, I was given like the cusp number there because the number of cusps actually corresponds very much to how dense those uh, blue lifts look in the universal cover. So this is our known totally geodesic surface. So a candidate surface we know still has to have one of those slopes, it's just gonna be like off a little bit. And so we can see visually, okay, that this candidate surface is going to run into the known surface. And we know that that intersection like has to be either cusp to cusp or closed geodesic. 
because of the intersection lemma. And we get more information because we know like if we're setting at a cusp and the other end has to be a cusp, which means we can use that trace field property of having all of the pre-images sitting inside the trace field to figure out what those intersections are and then showing just everything falls apart and you can't do that. Now, before anyone panics about that middle column where the uh, candidate surface doesn't actually run into the um, vertical hyperplanes of that ciphered surface, yeah, okay, fine. So what we have to do instead is we have to look at hemispherical uh, hyperplane lifts. And it turns out that you can like fill the gap between two of the vertical hyperplanes and the candidate surface will have to run into one of them and you can run some machinery and show that no such surface can exist. So that's fun. Now, if we were to go to uh, like a total um, absence, we obviously can't use the same process because we can't compare it to a known totally geodesic surface because there isn't one. So we have to work with something else. And in particular, we're going to work with a surface that like exists in all not complements. Like we're going to look at a ciphered surface instead and use that as a sense of like comparison, except for instead of comparing it like geometrically, we're going to look at it in the second cohomology rel boundary. We're going to define a norm on the second cohomology rel boundary. It's called the Euler class. The, the, this is very much a vibe, like this slide is going to be like a vague definition of things. Technically, this is the more of the construction of the closed case, and you have to change it a little to get the cusp case, but well, I'll be fine. This will give you a sense of how things work. If you have any representation from the fundamental group of your manifold into PSL2R, then any element from the fundamental group will act on H3, and its image is going to act on S1, um, where we're thinking of S1 as the boundary of hyperbolic two space. This gives us a very natural, non-trivial circle bundle. But we want to pick a particular map, and we're, we're going to use that boundary again, that torus boundary, and we're going to choose it so that the image of the fundamental group of that boundary is going to fix a single point in the circle. And that gives us a section in our circle bundle where we can map the boundary to the circle. In, uh, and it turns out it's trivial. And a question we have if we have a section on a boundary is, can we extend the section to the entire three manifold? And the answer is, Probably not. Uh, and the amount that it fails to extend, right, this obstruction is what we're going to call the Euler class. So imagine um, you have this, so that's a, that's a little cipher surface in there. And you can imagine that it's sitting inside of the trivial circle bundle and then like this, this fun circle bundle. And imagine you wanted to kind of wiggle things around a little bit. In the trivial case, you can always pop that surface right off of itself because of the way that it's uh, it's trivial, right? It can just like move. But in the non-trivial case, if you try to move it, it might kind of like decide to bend back in and intersect itself. And uh, yeah, so you can never like fully lift off of itself, right? And so the minimal intersection number, like the best that you can do to move it off of itself is what we call the Euler class. Uh, it's possible to prove that this acts as a norm on the equivalence class of surfaces inside the second cohomology group rel boundary, which uh, to our joy and delight is generated by uh, the minimal genus ciphered surface. So we have a way of uh, like previously we were comparing a, a candidate surface to a known totally geodesic surface. And here we're going to be kind of looking at the surface through the eyes of this ciphered surface. So here's our theorem. Uh, so let's say that we have a hyperbolic knot complement and that its trace field intersects the real numbers only at the rationals, right? And let's say that we have this ciphered surface F with minimal genus G. And let's say that we can find this representation from the fundamental group into PSL2R. Uh, it's going to wind up being a Galois conjugate of the usual geometric um, uh, representation into PSL2C. But if we find this map and can show that the absolute value of the Euler class with respect to phi um, is it's of, of the, the ciphered surface is strictly less than 2G minus 1, then our manifold contains no totally geodesic surfaces. And the vague proof of that is we start with um, the fact that this is going to be a cusp totally geodesic surface, because we have that proposition from earlier that rules out the compact one. And because it's a cusp totally geodesic surface, we know that it will kind of like exist in the second cohomology class, right? And we have this string of equality or technically inequalities, right? And you'll like we'll walk through it, but notice on the far ends, we have the negative Euler characteristic of our surface. So given that we should expect that it's like equal all the way across, there should be, to, you should be able to get from the far left to the far right with just full equalities. 
uh, and it's going to fail and we'll see why. So that first equality is coming from the fact that the negative Euler characteristic is going to be um, the same as like that minimum, uh, the, the minimum intersection number. So this is something that kind of follows around uh, Poincaré Hopf. That second equality uh, just follows from the fact that because this ciphered surface, sorry, because this uh, candidate surface is cusped, it's going to sit as a multiple of the ciphered surface in the second cohomology world boundary. And then that last um, inequality is just because F has um, a minimal genus, right, in a, in a Thurston norm minimizing way. And so we'll get a less than or equal. But then right there, right in the middle, boom, a strict inequality coming from our. Um, uh, our, our hypothesis. And so that busts. And the nice thing about this is that, you know, this, this reduces to a calculation where essentially we just need to find this map phi and then just crunch out um, what the Euler class of uh, phi of the, the ciphered surface is going to be, show that it's bounded by 2g minus 1, where g is the minimal genus of our ciphered surface. And then we can just say whether uh, we, can, we can claim that it has no totally geodesic surfaces. So uh, reminder that this is what we had like as of 2019, we had the um, infinitely many surfaces in the figure eight not complement. And we have this like smattering of things that have absolutely no totally geodesic surfaces. And since then, Khan and I have been able to uh, color in more of this chart. So we've got a whole bunch more that have no totally geodesic surfaces. And we have found five that have a unique totally geodesic surface. There are a couple more in this chart that are known to have at least one totally geodesic surface but the exact count isn't known yet. Um, and the goal that Khan and I have is to figure out like the necessary techniques in order to um, handle the rest of these, these cases. And one of the big things that all of these like uncolored cases have is they have like even degree trace field and they have proper real subfields that aren't Q. And so like the, um, the having no compact totally geodesic surfaces falls apart. And you can't use the fact that the not cusps are going to be sitting inside their rational numbers and all that kind of thing. Um, and we are hoping to find more ways around that to deal with it and uh, kind of finish up for all the hyperbolic knots. Thank you. I know I talk quick. <laughs> all right, well, let's thank Rebecca. Does anybody have any questions? So how far do you think you can feasibly push this in, in terms of uh, number of not crossing? So, you know, the, the title you have is, is less than or equal to nine. Uh, are, are there hopes for being able to go to you know, 10, 11, or how far can this kind of machinery still practically work? Right. The, the, the practical is the question, because you have to find the map and calculate the, the Euler class. And, you know, um, Sage Sage has its limits. Um, so we think it like it'll it, the machinery is still work, but it's the, the problem is that it's not nice and feasible to kind of generalize the calculation of the Euler class because you have to find a particular map. So that's a shame. Um, the things for the uh, twist knots and the odd prime pretzel knots, those go up um, to to. Um, like that, that goes past nine crossings, just anything that's in that family of, of odd prime twists uh, works fine. And we're uh, currently working on finding different machinery because of how computationally um, kind of disgusting it winds up getting. Um, and that's going to, we're gonna work a bit with um, triangulation instead and see if there's an approach from that. Thanks, uh, any other questions? No, if not, let's thank Rebecca again.